Good evening, everyone. My name is Franco Pierno. I'm a professor at the Italian Department of University of Toronto. Today, I have the honor of inaugurating the new academic year's Gojo Lecture Series. I do it in, on behalf of our chair, Professor Luca Sumigli, who sends his regards and expresses his regret for not being able to join us due to family matters. I also have the honor of presenting you our Gojo visiting professor for the full term, Professor Michelangelo Zaccarello. Michelangelo Zaccarello is currently a professor of Philologia Italiana at the University of Pisa. And uh, his main research areas are the textual scholarship of early Italian literary texts and digital philology. He has spent visiting terms in several North American universities. Berkeley, Tucson, Indiana, Notre Dame, Toronto, and in European ones, Cambridge, Helsinki, Mitra, Slovakia, Lausanne. Many of his publications appear in South Italy, Belgium, Estonia, France, Finland, UK, Slovakia, Spain, Switzerland, and USA, and we hope also in Canada. <laughs> Amongst his Recently published volumes on textual scholarship, I can mention Edizione Critica del Testo Letterario, Mondadori, 2017, Teoria e Forme del Testo Digitale, Carocci, 2019, and Leggere Senza Libri, Cesati, 2020. Additionally, Professor Zaccarello is the president of ICON, or ICON which stands for Italian Culture on the Net, which is an important institute for the online teaching of the Italian language, literature, and culture. And these days, Kikon is finalizing an agreement with our department. So please join me in welcoming our guests, to whom I now leave the floor for today's lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm forever grateful to Professor Pierno and uh, the others at uh, the department for uh, their invitation. It's great to be back here after 21 years since my first visit. And uh, I am very happy to be addressing you this evening. Uh, it now becomes clear that I use the name of Leonardo da Vinci to draw you to listen to me. <laughs> It's not true. Uh, I have sort of shortened and rephrased my uh, title because I will try to contextualize Leonardo's work and Leonardo's ideas uh, in the outline of um, scientific and philosophical thought in Tuscany between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Uh, so, addressing, for example, some Aristotelian concepts that we'll see, such as natural and accidental acquired knowledge, uh, such as uh, prototypes of wisdom, uh, stereotypes of folly uh, during this period. Um, we'll see examples of uh, uh, experience based. Uh, issues and other logic-based assumptions that were current at the time. We'll see a profile of the figure of the artist between the Middle Ages craftsmanship and the mature Renaissance when a proper profile of the artistic genius is born. And Leonardo is indeed one of the paramount figures of this um, evolution. And in Leonardo's life, I would like to sort of, uh, especially for students, kind of locate uh, Leonardo's life and Leonardo's biography in the context of 15th and early 16th century Italy, uh, from his birth in 1452 to his uh, uh, sort of 
training in the workshop of Andrea del Ferrocchio, whom we'll mention as well, uh, from his uh, assumption uh, into uh, the number of the great uh, artists of his time, uh, working with uh, Ludovico il Moro in Milan first, uh, and then uh, from uh, 1517 for King Francis I in France until his death. As you all know, Leonardo died in France, in Amboise, in 1519. So, the Tuscan context of Leonardo's intellectual formation is one of late scholasticism, uh, Aristotelian philosophy based on primarily William of Ockham, that is, a logic-based nominalism that as assumes uh, syllogism, uh, logical inferential assertions, as the ground of true knowledge. This is implying a general rejection of practical experience as uh, deceitful. The uh, appearance that impresses senses and which needs to be uh, passing through the uh, check of reason. For example, uh, dialectics in this time uh, are generally uh, managed in utramque parte, that is an altercatio or disputatio, that uh, strives on the grounds of obvious uh, uh, rhetorical authorities such as Cicero and Quintilian uh, to uh, argue in favor or against any kind of topic regardless of its uh, more or less evident nature. Uh, this is uh, indeed uh, a way of um, translating scholasticism here you can see a wonderful portrait of St. Thomas by Carlo Crivelli through a grip of logic theoretical uh, reference that sometimes, more often than not, is found at odd with experience. That sort of gives birth without really getting into any detail about the development of such uh, philosophy, uh, that often uh, gives birth to a number of uh, realistic genres, short fiction, uh, lyric poetry, narrative poetry, that uh, sort of like uh, juxtaposes the uh, expression of logic and wisdom, and the expression of natural experience. Uh, the prototype of such opposition is a medieval Latin dialogue called Dialogus Salomonis et Marcolfi, which is incredibly widespread across Europe, translated into many languages, uh, and uh, um, sort of incarnates the radical opposition between official knowledge, uh, the prototype of knowledge and wisdom, Solomon, and uh, hands-on experience, the ugly yet extremely cunning peasant Markorfus. Uh, Markorfus is dark throughout the dialogue as Markorfus follies, and his folly is indeed one of the paramount uh, issues in his character. Now, as the dialogue unfolds, uh, <laughs> Markov's folly puzzles, to an increasing extent, Solomon's wisdom, to the point in which Solomon is unable to answer a number of questions and riddles posed by 
Markovs. That sort of uh, sets uh, the scenario <laughs> in which practice contradicts theory, in which experience contradicts logic. Uh, the source of this kind of paradoxes whereby um, visual, sensorial experience comes at odds with theory and with philosophy is indeed the pseudo-Aristotelian treatise Problemata, which many of you will know. In which uh, work uh, these kind of riddles are set out by means of paradoxes introduced by Y. Quam obrem, the AT in the Greek version. About 900 of those, uh, which are as uh, diverse as uh, why is it that uh, the freshest, uh, the bread is the hottest? Or why is that the coldest time of the night is right before dawn? <laughs> So by revealing hidden properties of nature, hidden aspects which deceive the human eye, and raising bewildered reactions in readers, problemata were absolutely instrumental in strengthening the importance of a closer, more in-depth look into nature, a more uh, detailed inspection of the reality around us. That's why the artists were a crucial figure to manage this kind of uh, uh, renewed look upon reality. In many literary works of the late Middle Ages, including Boccaccio's De Cameron, artists and craftsmen are uh, celebrated to uh, really uh, rejoin uh, experience with wisdom, to uh, celebrate the victory of their hands-on knowledge, and to uh, puzzle and ultimately confound uh, fake savants and uh, institutional figures of knowledge and wisdom, such as professors, such as doctors, such as astrologists, as we shall see. In Boccaccio's de Cameron, for example, many stories have artists as protagonists. Giotto, Bruno, Buffalmacco, Calandrino. And all these uh, painters, mostly painters, uh, are generally taken to uh, humiliate the official knowledge of certain figures. For example, Maestro Simone in day eight of the, the Cameron. And indeed, even in uh, Boccaccio's most famous imitator, Franco Sacchetti, we see the same prototype, the same pattern of an artist, or in this case, the manager of artists, because Sacchetti was the manager of uh, the making of San Michele, so he was coordinating the works of painters, sculptors, architects, and so forth. And in Novella 151 of his Trecento novelle, he um, engages in a real altercazio with an astrologist from Pisa. Fazio, probably reminiscent of Fazio de Giverti, <coughs> the author of the Tamondo, one of the most famous encyclopedic works of the Middle Ages, but certainly not him for chronological reasons. And uh, uh, Fazio contends that he can predict the future on the basis of his knowledge on the uh, philosophy that he has learned. And uh, Franco confounds him by saying, if you 
know the future, then tell me something about the present or the past. Like how many stairs in your home, in your household, or uh, what did you eat two days ago? How many ships entered the port? And so on. So ultimately, Fazio's logic backfires on him, and uh, uh, he's unable to tell reality from dream. The last question Frank Schetti asks from Fazio is, are you dreaming or not? And this is very important because it takes us to another paramount text of the time, which is the Novella Anonymous. Novella del Grosso di New York. Again, uh, a hoax uh, projected and carried out by an artist, Filippo Brunelleschi, in 1406. The text is some years later, of course. But since Manetto Legnagol, so a wood worker, uh, refused to join the Brotherhood of Artists uh, for a dinner, he is uh, punished with this kind of hoax, whereby he is led to believe that he has become someone else. Because Brunelleschi uh, invites uh, Manetto's mother out of town and replaces her, uh, imitating her voice and so on. Plus, other Florentines, knowing about the hoax, are addressing him with a different name to the extent that he starts to believe he really has become someone else. And uh, the novella has a happy ending, because Manetto, who is ashamed of having fallen to such a, a gross a host, um, flees the city, goes to Hungary, works for the king of Hungary, and makes a lot of money. So there is, uh, in a way, a happy end. What does this have to do <laughs> with Leonardo? It has to do that in Leonardo we see very much the same kind of radical opposition between natural wisdom and accidental knowledge. That is, knowledge derived from direct experience, hands-on experience, and accidental knowledge acquired by books, by study. Uh, Leonardo often refers to uh, these kind of uh, uh, knowledges, uh, remarking the superiority of the natural mind stressing out how important it is to build one's uh, art on direct experience, on direct observation. And he does so in exquisitely Aristotelian terms. He said, for example, good letters are born out of good intellect. And since one should better praise the reason than the effect, you will praise good intellect without education rather than good education with no intellect. So, in many annotations that Leonardo makes in his uh, several books that we, we are very lucky to have, we find the opposition between theory and practice. I have recently published an article in English on this specific subject in a good volume, which I would like to advertise, not for my essay, but for the rest, which is Nudity and Folly in Italian Literature from Dante to Leopardi. We presented that in Naples recently. For Leonardo, there is no doubt that the commander is signed. But the soldiers are what matters. Practice are soldiers. The former, science, knowledge, philosophy, is nothing without experience. 
with more specific reference to perspective and painting, uh, Leonardo talks about other painters who, instead of observing nature, imitating nature, are actually imitating other artists. They are following the usual training in some painters' workshop. People to whom nature was not generous. They dress in just superficial gifts, accidental knowledge, without which they could join a flock of sheep. Gente poco obbligate alla natura, perché solo da accidental vestiti senza quale potrei accompagnarvi infra gli armenti delle bestie. So for Leonardo, there is really this idea of nudity. Nudity that uh, at the same time indicates the true nature of uh, reality and also the elementary mind without which uh, the uh, accidental knowledge uh, is uh, ultimately useless. Once the acquired scholarship of painters, artists is stripped off, they have no use in society. This is very interesting also because Leonardo famously describes himself as uomo senza lettere, the man with no letters. I know that being no humanist, non essere io literato, many arrogant people will blame me for being a man with no letters. Foolish people, they say that having no education I cannot properly say what I need to explain. They don't know that my things are drawn from direct experience rather than from other authors, and that experience is the sole teachers of all who wrote well. Hence my description of Leonardo as a hands-on Renaissance man, because experience in the case of perspective, observation is the only source for the true art. Experience is always right. Only our judgments are wrong, as they expect from experience what she cannot offer. Men are foolish to complain about her. These are again Leonardo's words. Accusing her to be elusive. Leave her alone and turn those complaints against your own ignorance. Now, it's interesting that Leonardo was himself a pupil of Andrea del Verrocchio, as you all know. So, Leonardo himself learned his skills within the workshop of a famous, prominent painter of the time. Uh, the catalog of uh, Verrocchio was recently published uh, by uh, Marsilio, so you can you can have uh, a look. So this is not to say that uh, experience should only be drawn from direct observation. Leonardo has very clear that uh, a sort of master is crucial. But this brings us back to a very important myth of the medieval and the Renaissance artist. The myth of perfectly cloning, perfectly imitating uh, the artist of best of all, that is God. God's work of art is nature. So imitating nature in a perfect way means to be the perfect painter or sculptor and so on. In chapter 35 
of Pliny the Elder's Naturalis Historic, for example, uh, Zeus uh, is praised for having painted so perfect fruit that birds came in flocks to eat it. And Zeus was uh, complaining about not painting the boy holding the basket of fruit well enough because otherwise the birds would have been scared by the boy. So there is a, a, a sort of like a incredible insistence on the trompe l'oeil uh, idea. Giotto was famous for the same reason, for painting things which could uh, compete with nature's own uh, looks. His outstanding ability was such that uh, he could depict anything in a way that uh, people would be deceived. But, and this is for example also in uh, Boccaccio's De Cameron, but the same Giotto is described in Sacchetti, but also in uh, Boccaccio, in other passages, as a natural philosopher. That is very important. Someone who can imitate and observe nature so well, uh, extracting the secrets from what he sees and uh, reproducing uh, the charm, the beauty, of nature itself, is also a natural philosopher. This could be the topic of another talk, so I would like to sort of restrict myself to Leonardo for the good reason that uh, I don't want to be led astray from our main focus. But also in Leonardo, the fake savant the uh, philosopher, astrologists, doctors, those who pretend to have the key to knowledge, are often mocked. Let's read another of the deity. In all their natural words and deeds, those who are foolish by nature and wise by education come on to speak, even though they seem wise. In their knowledge. Just like iron gets rusty when not used and water rots with when steel, when still, sorry, our intellect fails without practice. So Leonardo insists very often in this idea that it is experience, and ultimately practice, that <coughs> makes uh, the difference. We can read that scattered in many of his books, but we can also draw it from Leonardo's own readings. We are very lucky to have a few book lists that tell us what Leonardo was reading. Clearly, Leonardo might have read even many of things. But we know for sure that he read certain vernacular books by the two main lists, one in the Codex Madrid II and one in the Codex Planticus. Leonardo, uomo senza lettere, reads vernacular much more than he reads Latin. He tends in spite of the stereotype of the father of modern science, he leans towards humanistic fields, poetry, <coughs> short stories, <coughs> almost no philosophy, no science. Volgarizzamenti, that is, uh, uh, works by Pliny or Ovid, translated into the vernacular. And, for example, a very strong presence of Dante. Now, 
this could be the topic for another gojo, and uh, the gojo should be given by my good friend Barbara Fanini, one of the greatest specialists of uh, Leonardo's language. But I just uh, quote a couple of examples here, in which Leonardo uses a very typical uh, and very, a very sort of quintessentially Dantean line. Di qua, di là, di giù, di, di, di su, di giù. That's what Dante says in the beginning of Canto V of Inferno about Paolo and Francesca being thrown around by the bufera infernal che mai non resta. And Leonardo uses twice, as you can see, in the Codex Atlanticus and in the Codex Arundel, exactly the same uh, sort of uh, spring of adverbs. So we come to consider, and I'm approaching my conclusions, we come to see Leonardo as a multifaceted icon because Leonardo was working in a period in which the full recognition of the artist's genius is still to come. The qualities of the artist are still measured in terms of imitation of nature. This will not always be the case with a great artists of the early Cinquecento, with Raffaele, with Michelangelo, that we'll address shortly. Yet Leonardo represents, as a writer, as an artist, as a fictional character, Leonardo embodies the far-ranging cultural tradition whose main features are adequately, adequately represented by the tradition of short stories that I mentioned before, by Boccaccio, by Sacchetti, and by Bandello. Because Leonardo is the protagonist. You no, know, Bandello writes in the early 16th century, the first half of the 16th century, and Leonardo is the protagonist of novella 52 of book one in Bandello's story. At Milan's court, Leonardo is asked by a cardinal how much does he make working for Duke Ludovico of Mar. And uh, Leonardo answers that he gets 2,000 ducati d'oro every year as a base. Plus, he says, countless gifts and extras. Now, in Milan, the Ducato d'Oro uh, weighed uh, 3.5 grams and had a very high degree of purity. So I tried to convert this in modern currency and that equals roughly 360,000 Canadian dollars a year. This is just in a few years, not even decades, the evolution of the figure of the craftsman from the humble workshop in which he sort of develops practical skills to the artist as a genius, as we'll see uh, Michelangelo and Raphael. In Bandello's collection, uh, uh, this story tells us uh, uh, a very important truth. Art is a universal language, just because it comes directly from nature. It is a universal language. So when Filippo Lippi, another prominent artist of the previous century, is uh, held captive by <laughs> savages, by pirates, and uh, uh, imprisoned in Maghreb. He eventually, by drawing and by uh, letting them know about his art, he makes friends with them. 
he is rewarded and treated like a companion. Compagno. So, even from a humble, down-to-earth, monetary perspective, Pandello's stories tell us very clearly that uh, between the late 15th and the early 16th century, there was a real revolution in the social status and in the economical treatment of artists. The same change that in the history of the arts is very well told by paramount books such as Rudolf and Margot Wittkover, Born under Shutter. And uh, indeed, the uh, sovereigns and princes of Europe competing against each other to secure the collaboration of such artists is indeed a very, very important uh, sort of uh, uh, evolution in the uh, social status, in the dignity of uh, the arts themselves. Uh, we can say that with a figure such as Michelangelo, who lived throughout the stages, because he was born in 1476 and died in 1564 with an enormous funeral celebration in Florence, we can say that Michelangelo sort of witnessed the whole process. And uh, his uh, uh, presence in contemporary writings, the um, treatment of artists in contemporary Book of Manners, for example, in uh, the Book of the Courtier by Baldassar Castiglione, uh, there is a strong encouragement to patrons to secure the uh, collaboration of prominent artists. And I would like to finish off my talk by showing you a stroke or sketch of genius by Michelangelo himself, who, whilst painting the 16th chapel between 1508 and 1512, over 300 panels that he had to paint in this position, this is a sketch by Michelangelo himself, which is included in a letter to John of Pistoia, in which he recounts the suffering of having to paint in this position for so many months, uh, with his spine stretched like a Syrian bow, and his stomach thrusted out to balance the body's tension. And indeed, the suffering of the artist in the creation of such a world's masterpiece can well sum up my point about uh, the parable of artists going from the humble craftsmanship of the, say, mid-15th century to the world celebration of the mid-16th. Thank you very much. Michelangelo for an interesting lecture. I think we have around 15 minutes for questions and remarks. And Professor Zakhar and Leon is taking questions both in Italian and in English. Both in Italian and in English. Just don't write me to uh, utoronto. .ca email because uh, I cannot check yet another mailing box I cannot manage. So this unip.it inbox is the one if you want to be answered swift. Yes, Laura. Um, I don't know if I'm looking at you, you want to give me the mic or...
Yes, because I cannot hear you, so let alone from home. Okay, so first, thank you, thank, thank you very much for this uh, very rich and inspiring talk. Um, so I have actually two questions for you. Um, one is uh, how you frame within your argument about uh, Leonardo's self-fashioning. Um, he called for experiential learning that you can find, for example, in Bulgari Zelenki. I was seeing that, especially in vernacular pedagogy. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, that is La Sera, but also like that rich tradition of times that really we called for, you know, you want to learn that? Like, look and look at this stuff, look at this stuff, you know? So there's a call for that experience of objects that, so like there are pieces like Dimash Dumont, for example, is from 13th century France, and you can see like, you know, you want to learn how the sun goes around the sun, go and pick a candle and make an experiment. So this is really, I think, interesting in thinking of whether Leonardo's like, access maybe to texts such as these and how uh, he uh, so, like, used them to formalize his own difference according to his competitors, essentially. Uh, and that would be the first question. Uh, the second one would be uh, about differences between Leonardo and his competitors, because he talked quite a lot about so, like, access to education and knowledge. I kind of saw already also a so, like, difference in so like access to uh, so like cognitive capabilities. So these people, there was a striking quote where you meant, like when you mentioned that these people are also fooled by nature. So in a way, there's a circular argument here because these people are incapable of seeing nature and nature herself sort of like gave them those like limited capabilities. So how does that play in your argument? Because there's already, in a way, a uh, system, in my opinion, regarding like differences of being, right? Like, he is above the others in some way, not only because he has access to uh, sort of like a different way of seeing, but also because, like, you know, again, this goes back to his capabilities to a certain degree. Thank you. I'm uh, very grateful to Laura for both uh, these questions, uh, particularly because you mentioned uh, the Sfera by Gorodati, uh, which alongside with the Fazi de Nubetis di Tamondo was one of the paramount sources for geographical and cosmological knowledge for the use of merchants. So this is uh, a jolly good example to uh, demonstrate what I was trying to argue. Because uh, geography, cosmography were not studied as science, were not studied as theoretical disciplines, but were studied in, pra studied in practice uh, on the grounds of travels carried out by explorers, merchants, uh, by travelers of many kinds, who reported and squared um, the tradition of medieval Portolani tells us that uh, uh, navigators were able to use the stars uh, to assess their position in the sea in a very accurate manner, which allowed them to grow um, geographic charts long before the first uh, scientific cosmography was even born. If we want to wait until, for example, Johannes Blaus, uh, Atlas Maior, Sive Cosmographia Blaviana, we are already looking at the early 17th century, so long after the period that we're talking about. Uh, and this is for your first question. Uh, for the second, indeed, um, the idea of experience that uh, Leonardo had was not, of course, at odds with science altogether. If one looks at uh, uh, the treatment of optics in many codices of Leonardo, then you, you truly see him as a pioneer of modern science. But uh, well, what you said is, is accurate, because the possibility of um, an intuition of uh, the rules, the laws of nature, was restricted to those who had the observation skills needed to interpret what the nature had to say. And many others were just incapable of uh, 
detecting such uh, ingredients in what they were seeing and they were only able to rely on somebody else's interpretation of nature. And that is his stark criticism, which emerges in a number of quotes. I've only selected a few, but seriously, you would, uh, if you read uh, the Detti or Proemi, you would stumble into a number of similar assertions by Leonardo. Thank you. Olivia, um, let's wait for the mic, because okay. otherwise we're going to hear you. I was wondering, how, how would you define Leonardo's school of thought in the broader context of anti-intellectualism in general? Because obviously the contexts are very different, but let's say, for example, um, there's a lot of reasons for, let's say, the rise of anti-intellectualism in North America and distrust of academia in general. And I'm just wondering how you can separate their school of thought from today's school of thought and, and what exactly sets them apart from this distrusting knowledge of academia in general. No, I haven't heard quite distinctly what you said because uh, the, your voice is very feeble or maybe the mic is not working, I don't know. But as far as I've heard, um, certainly there are analogies, like often we can see in a uh, uh, reading early literature and connecting it with uh, our uh, modern day experience. Certainly when science, and particularly when the apostles of science, are uh, increasingly adopting views which are at odds with people's own experience and people's own views, then obviously there is an increase, and we have seen that with COVID, uh, we have had a very, very good example of this. People are increasingly um, uh, growing resentment and uh, antagonism to this kind of institutional figures of knowledge and wisdom. That is not to say that, uh, you know, Novax people are justified in saying that, but certainly there is grounds for this kind of beliefs to, to grow. Uh, in Leonardo's case, uh, the uh, tradition of short stories uh, targeting this kind of figures is impressive. In Boccaccio's own, there is uh, uh, one, uh, one tale only which I urge to read. Day 8, Tale 9. Maestro Simone, who is led to believe that uh, there is a secret uh, ritual, a secret feast, whereby he'll be able to sleep with the most beautiful women in the world. And so he is taken by Buffalmacco on his shoulders uh, to the extent that when they are um, walking uh, along a sewer, uh, Buffalmacco pretends to stumble and drops him into, the, into deep uh, trouble. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an icon of the humbling of the institutional figure of wisdom. Because Maestro Simone is a famous doctor. Boccaccio tells us that he is all science and no real talent. He, that he tells us at the beginning of the story. But officially, Maestro Simone is a distinguished, renowned doctor. And he ends up, because of his naivety, he ends up in the sewer. Elisa. Anche per rispetto a Leonardo ci riteniamo. Perfetto. Tradizione di militanza per la lingua, per una collare, contro lingua letterata. E, um, ho tante osservazioni che ringrazio moltissimo per questa, per questa lezione. 
La prima è che, vabbè, è stato da fuori adesso, mi fa molto piacere questo, questo riferimento al nostro Simone, anche perché mi conforti in un'idea sulla quale avevo lavorato un pochino di tempo fa, ovvero che lì ci sia proprio un problema di statuto epistemologico della medicina, no? Che è una disciplina che in questo momento si sta affrontando, sta cercando di, eh, come dire, presentarsi come nuova scienza eh, forte, egemonica nel pantheon delle, delle discipline. Eh, rispetto a una questione sì. molto interessante eh, della quale stavate discutendo con Laura, quindi delle, delle zone no, di sovrapposizione in realtà tra un certo sapere di tradizione scolastica e eh, nuova conoscenza sperimentale. Eh, voi menzionavate geografia, ottica, senz'altro mi chiedo quanto in realtà si possa nel caso di Leonardo parlare di un testo molto specifico che è molto il, il, la tradizione di conoscenza matematica algebrica, penso in particolare a Pacioli, e a quel contesto francescano lì che ha una tradizione di eh, così, da più hot, no? tra grandi paradigmi di estrazione scolastica e insistenza sul sulla conoscenza applicata e su, sull'esperienza come uh, fonte di, di, di nuovi saperi. E poi l'ultima domanda è, è proprio una curiosità perché ovviamente questo risuona molto con le facciate che interessano a me, è quanto del tuo lavoro sulla figura dell'artista, da artigiano a genio, eh, sia in realtà in risonanza con eh, l'altro caso paradigmatico che è nello stesso momento la figura dell'autore moderno, no? cioè da scrittore, scrittore di eh, scritti pragmatici a, a grande autore, cioè, una coppiata tradizionale all'opera certamente Gianni Boccaccio, verificata eh, da Vasari e dovrei sapere insomma dove vai a parlare con questo genere. Grazie, grazie mille per le due le domande. Io sto facendo un esercizio di mnemotecnica perché non mi sono portato da scrivere, quindi queste belle e ricche domande me le devo ricordare e devo, un po' come Dante, secondo il trattatello Bucacciano, fece con 14 questioni disputate in Utranco e Patrimo a Parigi, lo sappiamo se è vero, che lui riferì per filo e per segno allo stesso ordine Così io, solo due, ma spero di farcela, però se non ce la faccio mi raccomando, eh, avverti. Allora, per la prima domanda, forse non tutti sanno che Leonardo è ritenuto l'autore delle splendide xilografie del De Divina Proporzione di Luca Pacioli, eh, opera stampata nel 1509 con queste magnifiche eh, xilografie in larga parte geometriche, diciamo, proprio sulla prospettiva, sulle proporzioni, eccetera. Eh, ora non c'è una prova conclusiva che siano state eseguite su disegni di Leonardo, però è un'ipotesi molto affascinante. Non c'è dubbio che eh, sarebbe un'ennesima prova che eh, l'osservazione, la eh, formulazione di teorie e di criteri appunto per il disegno in prospettiva eh, sono alla fine due facce della stessa medaglia come si vede appunto nei, eh, nei codici appunto che eh, riguardano appunto l'ottica come dicevamo prima cioè. eh, per quanto riguarda la seconda domanda e qui comincio ad avere difficoltà a eh, ricordarmelo ma eh, ci provo eh, dunque no, mi devi aiutare perché comincio ad essere stanco sai? artista moderno autore moderno scusami hai ragione, è chiaro che l'autorialità medievale, che era un'autorità un'autorialità secondo Bonaventura di, da Bagnoregio che era solo in minima parte originale, perché l'autore poteva essere un compilato poteva essere eh, un commentato, uno scritto, eh, ma solo raramente era lui stesso un autor, perché i veri autori sono i classici, i classici sono la base dei quali si commentava, si glossava, si, si espandeva, si spiegava, 
Quindi l'autore medievale è essenzialmente un magister che in cattedra, eh, come dire, spiega e spezza il pane della conoscenza per il suo pubblico. Naturalmente in questo caso cominciamo a vedere più o meno in parallelo, ma io eh, direi che forse possiamo far risalire come dire, questa, questa svolta verso come dire, una maggiore autonomia e una maggiore eh, diciamo, eh, riconoscibilità anche dello stile eh, a Dante, perché Dante ha surto quasi immediatamente con i primi commenti anni 20 30 del 300 al canone dei classici, commentato, spiegato, letto pubblicamente, è equiparato agli autonomi. Quindi quello che in qualche misura Giotto, appunto, in parallelo a Dante, eh, fa, ma che si completa, come ho cercato di dirvi, solo fra 4 e 500, forse nella autorialità volgare si può, mi fa anche strano eh, dare questa risposta a una dentista illustre come Elisa, eh, ma forse è proprio Dante questa svolta per cui poi, come dire, anche autori che imitano in maniera abbastanza pedissequa, eh, come non so, il... Eh, quadriregio di Frezzi che è veramente una scopiazzatura no, della commedia però ecco il, il fatto stesso che eh, come dire nello stesso modo in cui Dante aveva diciamo così imitato il sesto dell'Eneide così Frezzi imita la commedia questo è già come dire a mio parere o almeno può essere argomentato come un segno di storia una strategia segnologica Prego, grazie a te. Thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering in your research on Leonardo's understanding of natural knowledge, I'm wondering if you considered how the notebooks we have from the Royal Library collection in London might contribute to your argument. Because I'm particularly thinking about the draft we know he had on the books on the human figure and the text and illustrations we have particularly. One aspect that might contribute to your thinking about nudity might be his, really his great interest and focus on embryology and how that kind of aspect he was very focused on in terms of revealing truth. So, yeah, I'm wondering what your, your thoughts. Well, first of all, I must uh, confess and admit to not being a specialist of Leonardo. I want to uh, address uh, the topic of natural wisdom versus acquired uh, scholarship uh, in the context of many authors that have studied more in depth than Leonardo. Here I was heavily relying on the cited Barbara Fanini, who is a real specialist, and who has conducted long research on the Windsor papers, for example, and indeed what you said about embryology in general, about anatomy in Leonardo, with the uh, long debated question whether Leonardo was able or not to uh, dissect corpses for his, uh, for his inspection. Uh, that all sort of adds up to um, a picture in which uh, the observation, the detailed and in-depth observation of reality is the key for understanding the dynamics, the function of nature. So I, I believe that uh, Indeed, uh, we could find uh, countless other proofs of uh, Leonardo's reliance on such principles. As I said before, um, I used perhaps Leonardo's name to uh, attract your interest, but by no means uh, am I a specialist of Leonardo. I have uh, 
written three or four articles on his literary writings, which are collected from decades ago uh, and therefore are available for public uh, reading. Uh, each and every one I have checked on the manuscripts, thanks to Barbara, who holds an archive of all the images of the manuscript. And, but other than that, I must decline now the responsibilities as, as a Leonardo special. This is the last question. Since you uh, cited uh, Boccaccio on several occasions, um, I just want to suggest a little novelletta uh, in the introduction to day four of Filippo Balducci uh, and his son. I don't know if you are familiar with it. And, uh, you know, he retreats to a cave and uh, keeps his son detached from reality uh, until he's about well, puberty, until he reaches puberty, about 15, 16, or whatever. And he brings him to Florence for the first time. And his son is asking what these magnific magnificent things that he has seen for the first time are. And, you know, it's called the Novelita delle Patere because the of course, that, he sees some women and his father's afraid of calling them women because they may incite his son. So he calls them Papere. And of course, the son wants to take some of the Papere home to the cave. But the novella ends in, uh, and I, I'm going to get this uh, wrong, but something like uh, his father feels defeated in trying to mask the reality. And it says something like, uh, e più aria forza la natura che <laughs> This story. is the bottom line yes. of all these stories. I could cite another interesting uh, tale, which was current. The time. I don't know how many of you will have heard of the Motti e Facezzi e del Piovano Rotto, but it's an absolutely magnificent, anonymous collection of short stories, which was assembled in Florence somewhere between the 1470s and 1480s. And one of these many tales, but actually it's a tale that has a medieval tradition behind that is that of the uh, cats and the camels. I don't know if you um, remember, but essentially uh, Florentine merchants were uh, um, sailing towards Flanders, where Florentine merchants were often going to sell and buy merchandise, and one so-called philosopher uh, wanted to show everyone that he had taught cats to hold candles like this, you know, standing on their uh, back legs and holding candles. You know, not a lot to accept the challenge and the goal was to see this wonderful show. Uh, then when the cats are holding the candles exactly as the philosopher has uh, anticipated they would, uh, Piano Lotto throws some mice in the middle of uh, the cats. And obviously the cats are leave the cat and chase her. <laughs> so, <coughs> sorry, uh, I'm starting to talk too much with the tide. Uh, so, the bottom line is that the nature can overthrow whichever accidental artificial training that uh, uh, men can impose. So, uh, to go back to the tale of the ducks, uh, uh, Filippo uh, has been educated very restrictedly and uh, his world has been limited very severely. But as soon as the natural uh, senses are hit by something as beautiful as we, then he suddenly goes back to the original uh, nature that has uh, always the upper hand.
Grazie mille a tutti e a tutte. Thank you.